Thanks for listening in to another episode of Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. Please remember to subscribe, hit the like button and share. I'm delighted to welcome on our show today, Annie Lobert. Annie is the founder of the organization Hookers for Jesus. Yes, you heard right, Hookers for Jesus. Now, Annie is also the author of the book Fallen, out of the sex industry and into the arms of the savior. Annie's story is a powerful one, one of overcoming and survival. In Fallen, Annie tells her remarkable story of surviving sex trafficking with 16 years in the sex industry, breaking free, finding healing, and then reaching back to help others also find freedom. Her memoir, opens a window into a sordid, shadowy world of sex trafficking, but shows just how bright God's light can truly shine in the darkness. After surviving more than a decade of sex trafficking, Annie started Hookers for Jesus in 2005. They are a survivor-led outreach and safe house for women looking for an escape from the sex industry. Addressing the harmful effects of prostitution, sex trafficking and sexual exploitation linked to pornography and the sex industry, Hookers for Jesus help women who have been negatively affected by the sex industry find hope, healing and full restoration. Annie, thank you so much for joining us here. I'm delighted to welcome you on Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. And I'm Girl. Just- <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, Allison and Jay. I'm telling you, having a great time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because I, I came across your story and your journey. I don't like to really use the word story, but I came across your journey um, on social media. And I was reading about you and looked at your websites and what you do. And I just thought, this is a powerful, powerful story of exactly as you say, restoration, healing, and survival. But one of the things I completely want to dispel this complete myth of, sex trafficking is not the way we see it on movies like Taken. It is not. Mm. I have spoken to young ladies, gentlemen, who have been victims of what they call familial trafficking, where they get into sex trafficking and they, they're into the sex industry as a result of family members introducing them to that. It's not just the thing where somebody gets kidnapped and they're never heard of it again. So Annie, if you could help us in, um, by sharing your journey. Absolutely, Alison Jay. That is true about the familiar trafficking. And that is something that is hidden in plain sight. We can't really see it because if you see a child that's being sex trafficked, you won't really see her because she'll be with her mother or father or uncle or auntie or big sister. And what you won't realize seeing them out at maybe Walmart or at the mall, or maybe they're walking the dog in the park. Everything looks kosher. Everything looks like, oh, they're having a great time. It's family. But if you lift the veil and, and you dig deeper, you might notice a bruise on that child's arm or something just off. Like she's dressing a very, very sexy, let's say. And not, this is not all the case by the way, because sometimes they just leave the children really playing because that's what turns on the buyer. But a lot of buyers like to see little women, little girls dressed up as older women. It's really, it's like a fetish. So you know, to see that it's, it's, it's very disheartening, but at the same time, a lot of people can't see it because they're not looking if you don't know what to look for. Now, as far as me, my family did not traffic me. I was trafficked by my Romeo pimp. He was my boyfriend and I got into the sex industry, not with him. Now, this is where people say to me, well, Annie, I mean, you started working in the sex industry as a stripper and as an escort, it's pretty much your choice. I mean, but you don't understand when the enemy of our soul, AKA Satan, AKA Lucifer, his minions, AKA demons, because that's what minion means. Be careful watching the movie minions. (laughs) It means demon. (laughs) Right? So 
when you have this vulnerability that's already preconditioned you to be subject and, you know, basically targeted by traffickers, it's really hard to not be that target because you don't know you're the target, Allison J. You don't know you're being targeted. You really think that this person cares for you. So let me just, in a nutshell, just d- describe my background. My dad was an alcoholic. He was in the Air Force. We, I went to seven different schools. He was abusive towards my mother in front of us kids. He would hit us kids. He hit my brothers more than me. I was very resentful. By the time I was uh, 18, I moved out of the house the next day, basically graduated high school, got three jobs. And during that time in high school, got date raped got my heart broken. And you know, when you get date raped, you just don't know what happened because you wake up and you're like, what just happened? I got too drunk. Maybe some, some drug was put my drink, my, my drink, whatever it was. And I wake, wake up sore and you know that something wrong happened. Right. So just think about that in the back of your mind, because trauma for me did not start with those date rapes. Trauma started the first time I ever saw my father yell and hit my mother and make her nose bleed, give her a black guy. A child can't handle that type of upbringing without the damages of complex trauma and complex trauma. The difference between PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder and complex trauma is this PTSD um, is something that is manifested from, let's say a car accident, you know, the, the soldiers in war, Mm -hmm. they have, it's something called shell shock. They've witnessed horrific things Mm -hmm. or let's say, Yes, maybe it's just one domestic violence incident that you witnessed. You witnessed someone being murdered. Uh, You're in a hurricane. You see houses being taken away. You see a a tornado uh, take away a house or whatever it looks like, a natural disaster, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a death in your family. You're devastated by it. That can develop PTSD, which is high anxiety, nightmares, uh, fight, flight, or freeze response. But with complex trauma, it's insidious for staying with you. So in other words, as a child, you can't escape that dangerous situation because the dangerous situation is your parent. And if they're there living with you and they're continually being abusive, you develop disassociation skills. And what I would do is hide under my bed. I would play with my dolls. I would make up imaginary friends because it made me, it helped me escape. I didn't realize at the time I had trauma. Like I just thought this is normal life. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I became probably about 10 or 12. I started develop 10, 11, 12. I started developing my body and I I noticed the boys were looking at me and I became hypersexualized. Now here's a theory of psychologists, hypersexualization. I got sexually abused when I was eight and nine by a neighbor. Okay. I don't know if this started me off on my hypersexualization. I remember kind of feeling a certain kind of way as a little girl. Like I fell in love with Captain Kirk from Star Trek from watching Star Trek. I mean, it sounds weird, but I would fall in love with movie stars. Like when I was five, like, I don't know if that's normal. Maybe it is, but I'm always looking for that knight in shining armor. And so they say that children that are hypersexualized, it's because there's a lack of love in the family, the family structure. There's a lack of touch. There's a lack of hugging. There's a lack of, from both parents, by the way, my mom was great. My dad, I didn't really have a relationship with him. So that connection or disconnection that I needed, that connection I needed, right? I saw other boys give me, and that was my vulnerability for trafficking right there. So they- for someone to tell me I was beautiful. Go ahead. And to your point of saying that, it's many of us have been that poster child for looking for love in all the wrong places. And that's pretty much what it is because we haven't seen that healthy example of that man woman relationship. And, or it's a case of, in your case, you witnessed your mother being abused by your father. So, unfortunately, for some people, even though they know it's wrong, that is their normal. They were raised in dysfunction. So normal function is awkward, uncomfortable, and unfamiliar. So many people get caught in the pattern, the cycle, because that's what they know. That's what they grew in. And then you were mentioning about 
young men looking at you and affection. When you are starved of affection, when you have trauma as a child, it's like, for example, if you see an animal that is starving and you throw it anything to eat, you see how it just rushes to that thing, pounces on it and just starts to devour that. And it's a case of when you think about it, as human beings, as people, that's what we were made for that connection we were made for those relationships so therefore whether we realize it or not we crave it so when we get it and we see it whether it's from somebody that means you harm or means you good for those for so for people that literally crave it people that are starving for it guess what they're going to do they are going to latch on to the first person that shows it to them so in your absolutely that's what happened to you uh, you know, that's what happened to me. And let me tell you the hunger. I, I hungered and thirsted. Now this is Bible. Ready? Mm-hmm. I hunger and thirsted for affection, but I also hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Mm-hmm. My mind wanted to right the wrongs of my mom and dad's relationship. I really believed with all of my heart that there was a prince out there mm-hmm. and that I would be that girl that would be separated, set apart, chosen to play that role in someone's life that was very important, that would love me, honor me, cherish me, hold me, be my best friend, take care of me. And I never, by the way, Allison Jay, I never let go of that. The whole time I was being trafficked. And by the way, I was trafficked by it's three people, three different people now. So I've said two pimps, but there was another type of trafficking that happened after that was actually work-led, work-based trafficking, a little bit of sexualized trafficking, but many, many, many years of it. And so I wonder if people are thinking, well, Annie, how did you get trafficked? So what does a girl do when she is looking for love? She just does whatever she can to get it. And let me tell you, I got three jobs. I worked really hard. I wanted to get my own place, my own car. I was still a teenager. I had a fake ID to go to the nightclubs. And of course, the night that we walk into the nightclub, it's now called Choices in downtown Minneapolis. Back then, it was called Marshalls. It's a white brick building over by Washington. And I, gosh, I can't remember the other name of the street. And uh, man, it was like this nightclub I knew that I could get into. I knew the owner and he knew we were not of age. But we went in there and these men walked in one night and they were like dressed top to bottom with beautiful clothes on, you know, beautiful designer shoes, uh, suits, and they had a Rolex watch and they were wearing Gucci sunglasses. And I know this sounds really cliche, but you know, that song by Corey Hart, I think it's Corey Hart. I wear my sunglasses at night. I mean, back then that was one of the tunes. So that didn't really bother me because that was already drilled in my head. Hey, it's okay to wear sunglasses at night. (laughs) You know, it's like, and I had no idea, my girlfriend and I, that they were traffickers. They bought us drinks. And actually the guy that was talking to me lived in Las Vegas and I was not attracted to him at all. My girlfriend took off with one of the guys within like a week or two. Um, started dating him. He gave her the keys to his car. He had a drop top white Mercedes Benz dipped in gold girl. And you know, as far as mm, I was like, Oh yeah, can I drive that car? Like I was like, that's the car for me. I mean, I was driving a Ford Tempo. Come on girl, red Ford Tempo. And I don't even know if they make those anymore. It was a car that wasn't very nice. And I desired the better things in life. And so my girlfriend called me up from Hawaii and said, come to Hawaii, girl, I'm making a lot of money. Wait till you see how much. And I was like, what? And so I flew to Hawaii. And uh, the first night that I worked, I turned my first trick. And what that means is I sold my body for money. And it was so easy because I had already gotten date rape so many times and I had been abused by men. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to charge for it. In other, in other words, I took my power back, girl. That was the night that I decided I'm going to take my power back. And so that's the lie that prostitution, escorting the sex industry will sell any woman 
that has been abused, hey, there's this little whisper in the ear. If you get the guy's money, you can use them and dump them. And that's what we tell ourselves. Yes, absolutely. See? That's what we tell ourselves, the lie. The enemy's lie to Eve was, did God really say that? Mm. I mean, if you eat it, you surely shall not die. So that's the lie in my head. I'm just going to do this. And it's business. This is all business. There's no feelings. There's no kissing. I never kiss men that purchased me. I was like, ew, I, you know what? I'll do whatever it takes to get the money, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do certain sexualized things. I had limits. I was very prissy when it came to my standards for how I was going to sell myself. Funny. It's like, you're Annie. Hello. You're selling yourself. There's really no standards. <laughs> One of the things that you actually told yourself as well, I'm going to, you know, you're a bit like a drug addict. I'm not an addict. I can stop at any time. I did be, I did believe that. I, but you know, it's really crazy, Allison, that money is so like the, 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 the pieces that come with it, the there's, if you allow the spirit of mammon mm -hmm. to control you in your heart and your mind, money, the love of it can have power over you. Now it doesn't say money can have power over you. The love of money, when you bow to money, when you bow to favor, when you bow to that, I mean, come on, we, we, we're having problems right now in our world right now because of money, right? We got crazy stuff going on politically, uh, you know, health wise, right? Economy wise. And so we all see that when there's not money, the lack that people feel and the things that they will do. Did you know there's a record amount of young teenage girls and women selling themselves on webcam right now that no. they never did this before because of COVID-19? They're being drawn into the sex industry. And you know as well as I do, once you're on a camera showing everything you got, what's to stop you from doing it in person? If that person on the other end of that lens says, look, I'm giving you $200 today to watch you shake your booty on two songs, right? Great. Mm -hmm. what, if, what, if, what would it cost if I got to meet you in person? What if I give you 2000 mm -hmm. And this girl starving for money, she might go meet that guy for 2000 Girl, please. And, Instant. Yeah, but Instant you, call, girl. But not only that, if you think about it, we've got people meeting people on over the internet for less. So... You know, when you think about again these young girls, they may not they may be lured away by and haven't even not even received a penny yet, just the promise of it. So See, and that's the thing. You can sell someone a honeymoon. Disney does it all the time. I watched Disney growing up, they mm -hmm. sell you the dream. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you do this, this is the result. Yeah. You get this prince on the white horse. If you're a good little girl and you do everything everybody tells you and you obey. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like I literally went to Hawaii, came back to Minnesota, quit all three of my jobs, worked the escort services for a couple months. Two guys tried to kill me. I quit, started strip dancing in the, in the clubs, worked for a place called party time. That's okay. Remember everyone listening. I'm not trafficked yet. Mm -hmm. But the day I was working at Skyway Lounge, which is now on Hennepin Avenue, it is called Spearmint Rhino. And I was on that stage dancing and literally my trafficker walks in. I didn't know he was a trafficker and he was super handsome and he sweet talked me and told me I was beautiful. He pretty much learned me by my reactions to everything he asked me. Like he watched me, he watched me move. He watched me be very open about what I believed in. And that I was like, look, you know, the, all these men are, tr all these men are tricks. They're marks, they're tricks, they're buyers. And I'm going to get their money. I mean, so men are dumb. And I would say these things to him and he'd be like, wow, you're really smart. And I thought, man, this guy gets it. Like he sees me for what I'm doing and he's accepting of me. Not thinking, Allison J, that this guy's a trafficker. In fact, I told him, you know, I can't stand pimps. Pimps, they can just all go to hell. I mean, I was very adamant about expressing my opinion about pimps. I wouldn't give a pimp a dime. 
I wish he would. And girl, I got sassy with it. Mm -hmm. And then of course, my girlfriend at this time, she had moved to Las Vegas from Hawaii. And of course, her pimp, he had houses all over the, he had, I think he had a place in Vegas, Minnesota. He shared a place in Hawaii with this friend. There's other cities in Baltimore, Chicago. Anyway, she comes to Las Vegas and tells me, hey girl, it is on here. Like the money here is thousands every night. And now remember, this is the eighties. So you need to double that figure. Yeah. Okay. And so if I got a thousand on a call, it's 2000 today. If I got 3000, it's 6,000 today. If you look at the inflation calculator, mm -hmm. money back then was flowing freely. And I came to Las Vegas and of course, guess who I invited? I invited my boyfriend, the one that I thought was my boyfriend, the one that romanced me with dinners and clothing and mm -hmm. jewelry. And he moved in with me, actually. I let him move in with me. I found out he was a drug dealer and he was on probation. He had to do like these little pictures where you take pictures when you're checking in with their probation department. I don't know why I didn't think that was a red flag, Allison J, but I just was like, oh, he's going to be better. He's going to do better. And girl, the first night that I worked, that was it. Like I came home, he said, break yourself. And I said, excuse me, who are you talking to? Like, that's definitely not me. Like I don't break myself to any pimp. And when someone asks me, what does break mean? It, it, pretty much uh, when a pimp says, break yourself, you have to give him every dime on you. Everything that you own, you lay it at his feet on his lap and you surrender. Okay. I was like, I'm not giving, I'm not giving you anything. What? <laughs> break, break this, you know, girl. No, he, he pulled me to the back and I remember I was fighting him and he, he got, he dragged me across the floor of the kitchen and he started banging my head between the cupboards and then pulled me out to the back of their porch, which was all cement. And in, in Vegas, you don't really have wooden porches. <laughs> you have cement porches. So started kicking me and yelling and choking me and uh, broke my ribs, punched me. I don't know how many times he was screaming, I'm your pimp B. And this is how it's going to be blood coming out everywhere. I mean, the first chapter of my book, it, it describes it so eloquently. It's, it was like, I couldn't, he, he shoved my face in dog feces for goodness sakes. Okay. I, did not even know what was going on. Like I was in so much shock. And when I laid down and my girlfriend's trying to call the cops, they locked her in the back bedroom, her pimp locked her in the back bedroom. And I'm trying to call the police mm -hmm. and I can't because there's no access to a phone. Every my beeper's gone. My ID has gone. Everything's gone. And back then I had a beeper. I, I, I had not gotten my new cell phone yet, but I was about to get a cell phone. Cell phones were, bigger like <laughs> they weighed a couple pounds back then <laughs> and so, a brick phone yeah and they were, they were like five bucks a minute okay so people complain about cell prices now i'm like please you guys don't even talk to me okay because uh, y'all don't even understand what i just went through so long story short that night he told me he loved me um he brought dressings to get rid of my blood and my cuts on my face and my head, I had cuts all over my head and told me this was the rules. I was going to submit everything to him. He was going to take every dime. He was going to control the money and I was his B. So that was it. Um, and you know, to your point though, when we really, really think about it, because I know you've got, there are many times people listen and it's easy to know and say what you would do if you're not in the position. Because we, I'm sure we've all said, yeah, well, if it was me, I would do this. And if it was me, I would do that. But when we actually, yeah. win, there's, there's very little difference. I'm not saying there are no differences, but there are very little differences between what you went through and what your mother went through. I know it, 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 it's very parallel in a way. Um, in fact, my father controlled my mom's every move, usually. It, exactly. it was crazy. <laughs> and because if you think about it, <clears throat> the, the difference is that the one fundamental difference is your, your trafficker was making you sell yourself, selling, selling your body. 
uh, but he was beating you, he was controlling you, manipulating you and all those things. But your father was doing the same thing to your mother with the exception of the son in herself. So if we want to look at it a different way, Annie, generational cycles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, there was a point where I actually met up with my father years later in 2006. We, I actually had my story. It was all over like the world because 700 club had interviewed me and TBN and I mean, and then the normal news. And then all of a sudden I was getting contacted by Nightline and NBC, MSNBC, like it was crazy. Um, I, in fact, I'm one of the first voices that ever came out talking about being a call girl and having an abuser take all my money. They didn't really have like a really like trafficking was a, a new term in 2000, mm -hmm. but nobody was using it. And a lot of people would say to me, well, it was your fault. I mean, you stayed there. Like you could have walked out that door, but not with psychological chains. Exactly. Not with, with all the terror mm -hmm. and the trauma bonding that happens, but it's the Stockholm syndrome. It is mm. basically you're, you're terrorized to believing that if you try to escape and, and I did try to escape, by the way, I, I left several times. He hunted me down and kidnapped me. So when you tell me, well, you know, I would have, well, I did escape sweethearts. <laughs> okay. Because, and I got kidnapped with guns to my head, like tell, explain to me how that's okay. Cause it's not okay. When you get trafficked, I've said this from the very beginning, very beginning being in the sex trafficking industry, that's what I call it, mm -hmm. is like the mafia. You, you, you cannot just quit. You're in it. Mm -hmm. And you know secrets. I mean, of course, we talked this earlier, but elites, like I was trafficked by Hollywood elites. And I don't care what anybody says. And even if they weren't a pimp, mm -hmm. they were purchasing me knowing I had a pimp. So they're still trafficking me, right? Mm, That's very not cool and not, you know, and so Jeffrey Epstein's not the only one that did this, okay? Mm. He's one of many, 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 many different people that are, that were, and we don't know if he's alive or not, right? <laughs> we're not sure. <laughs> that has been controlling, I mean, trafficking is not, a conspiracy theory. It happened to me. It happened to so many of my friends. In fact, Allison J, the lifestyle of being with a trafficker is so dangerous. I've had about almost 20 people that I have known that either got murdered, committed suicide, or got killed somehow, and it made it look like an accident because of their lifestyle. So if it's not dangerous, Explain that. Of course. It's the most dangerous pro uh, profession in the world for a woman. Hands down. Nice. I don't even want to call it a profession because everybody wants to legalize prostitution because it is legal in Nevada in the brothels, but it, you can't legalize paid rape. I'm sorry. It's paid rape. You know, it's just, it's, it's a, it, it's a terrible travesty to have your body subjected to so many different people mm -hmm. in the same day yeah and you just numb out like you literally like check out to deal with it and you just want that buyer to get whatever his rocks off to get to the next one so you can get get done with work like mm -hmm. you know um i should say done with rape because it's not work so for me it was torture i mean i thought you know that I would get something out of it. Like I would get a house and I would buy cars. And of course I had things, but whenever I left my traffickers, I left with nothing. Nice. So it's like, you don't, you don't make anything from it. Like you, you have people controlling you and they take every living thing that you had or have. Mm -hmm. So and it's, it's terrible. Like, and it's not like people think, or again, it's not like how it's glamorized in the movie. Pretty woman. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's great. She met her knight in shining armor. He... Oh my gosh. I wanted to be her so bad, Alison J. When I, I saw that movie actually with my trafficker, mm 
Mm. And I remember sitting in the theater. It had first came out. It, yeah, that's how old I am. When that movie came in the theaters, I told him I want to go see that woman. And I said, it's about a, it's about a prostitute. And he goes, what? I go, I want to see it. And, you know, Richard Gere has always been a crush of mine. So I was like, oh, my gosh, right? And the thing is, I sat in that theater. And at the very end, I, and even during the part where she was getting disrespected by that guy with the bald head that used to be on Seinfeld, I forget the guy's name. Uh, no. I just cried because I felt exactly what she was feeling. Like she was just a piece of meat and there was no respect there. And so when she had him come to the balcony with the roses, mm -hmm. I just bawled because I, I'm like, that's my dream. And, and then my, my trafficker goes, you know, snap out of it. Quit being emotional. And I said to him, you don't get it. But of course you were supposed to, you wouldn't you were it. supposed to be him i said you were supposed to be him but you're not i said that guy in the movie would never never traffic me now i didn't say traffic he would never use me because i didn't know the terms back then he wouldn't use me I and mean, i got a big fight with him actually about it so <laughs> that was hard girl seeing that movie and then i and then th that movie beauty and the beast came out by disney and i made him go see that with me too and I, I, it made me have a soft spot in my life for him because he was the beast to me. Mm. He was the person nobody understood. And he was underneath all that, that mask was royalty. And, you know, in Christ, that's absolutely the truth. He was abused by his mother severely. And so there was a monster inside of him that was taking over him every time he had a temper. Um, I still pray for him to this day. I know that God's going to get him. Mm. And I pray for my other trafficker too. The other one that came after him. But, the other one that came after him, he shot himself in the head. He's still alive. You see, so. the thing is, a couple of things just came to me as you're saying that, that you pray for them. Every, and that is what we're supposed to do. We are called to... Pray for those that what curse you, use you, and despitefully use you, right? So that's what we're supposed to do. Which a lot, and it's funny because a lot of people, when they read that scripture, they're probably only thinking of somebody that hurt their feelings because they said something bad about them, as opposed to, or or somebody that stabbed them in the back over a deal or spoke bad about them. But it covers more than that. It also covers. Pray for those that use you, abuse you, despitefully use you, those that curse you, those that mm. abuse you. It's, it's limitless at those who you're supposed to pray for. So it's really commendable of you that you take the Bible at its word like that and you do that. Yeah, I have no ill will for them. I, I, I just really pray that God just speaks to their hearts and... Um, you know, I, I have compassion, actually, and, and that's only from the Lord. There's no way I, I could have this on my own. And, and actually, Allison J., I knew the Lord when I was a little girl, and I carried him with me. And even though people would argue with me and say, well, he wasn't with you as you're trying to trick. You want to bet he was not? You want to bet my angels were there watching over me? I invited Jesus into my heart, and I really meant it when I was a little girl. Um, I went to church, Lutheran church growing up, but I learned the basics basically, right? I got confirmed even at 14. <laughs> you have to memorize all the Bible names when you do that, by the way. You have to do all these scripture memorizations. Anyway, it was crazy because you weren't allowed to take communion before that, but I still didn't snuck up there anyway because I like the wine that they would give, you know? So <laughs> um, all that to say, like, how does a church girl turn into a trafficking victim? It just doesn't make sense, but but it does. It does, though. I mean, just because you, just because you're a church girl and you grew up in the church, you still had the environment at home that you very toxic. You know, yep. Exactly. So so you grew up a church girl, but then you, when you think about the number of hours you spend in church, come to compared to the number of hours you spend at home. The, the majority of your time and your influence came from what you learned at home. So it's, right. again, if we think about the era that we grew up in, it, was one, it, wasn't one, it was one of those eras where 
people didn't really get involved in your personal life. People in the church, no. the pastor, the minister, they probably all knew that your father was beating seven bells out of your mother, by the way. But what did they do back then? And I'm not saying this to be derogatory or negative towards them, but that's what, at that time, in that era, that's what they did. That's what they knew to do. Everything was covered up. Everything was hush, hush. Yes. Not. Yes. So, there. Absolutely. There's an unveiling, even the past 10 years, social media and chat sites, our phones have brought us into this revealing. It's so awesome that John named Revelations, Revelations. We know Jesus probably told him the name of that, but the revealing of the truth. So when people are able to communicate that they're, they're broken, that they're hurt, that they're in trouble, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We can save lives that way, right? Mm -hmm. Back then, like you said, it was the 70s. It was the 80s. It's 60s even. I was born in 67. My mother, like you'd never heard about domestic violence. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember when that movie came out in the, it was the late 70s, maybe early 80s. Farrah Fawcett called The Burning Bed. Okay. And I, I watched it and I was like, whoa, it was a true story about a lady that burned her husband to death because he had been abusing her for years, years on end. And she couldn't take it anymore. So she burned him to sleep. In fact, you know, I don't remember what year that came out, but I know it was, gosh, a long time ago. And um, she was a huge hero of mine because I was, you know, a fan of Charlie's Angels. So, <laughs> um, so, you know what? And that's the thing is that we walk in love. You know, and it, it says in Galatians 5.1, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. We stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So I didn't understand that. I never read the New Testament when I was a little girl. I read bits and pieces, a little scripture. And, and, but when I read that as a woman that was surrendered finally to my Savior, Jesus, it brought on a whole new meaning. And if I would have known that scripture and understood what it really meant, I might not have gotten trafficked. Mm -hmm. If I would have had education about domestic violence, if I would have known trafficking was a thing and to be warned about evil people out there, because for me, I had evil in my home. Like, why would I think evil would always be there? Like, here's the thing, like as far as outside, for me, outside meant escape. Yeah. Outside meant there was new relationships and they won't treat me like that. I mean, I've been watching Disney. They're going to treat me good. I knew there were villains out there. I knew what a villain looked like. You know, it was someone that was breaking the law. That They didn't take a shower. They looked a certain type of way. But my trafficker didn't look like that. He looked like my boyfriend. He looked like, like the man that I loved. Mm -hmm. So... It, it, it's all a perspective of where you are in your walk and also where you are in your experience. I, you know, wisdom Proverbs is the bomb girl, bomb.com. It is because I I also, I don't think we should take away from the fact of these people are very slick and they're very clever because again, to your point, you were saying about you were a church girl and he knew the basics however the that if we think about the word that they use grooming and a lot of these people because um i was speaking to a, a young lady and she was telling me about the statistics and she says it's approximately three percent of people that are inst introduced to trafficking through being kidnapped. The, the other 97% is either through familial trafficking or somebody that the person knows in your case. Your yeah. Family. Yes. Right. It's someone that you know. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship. Exactly. So if we look at that 97%, you don't meet the guy today and tomorrow He's going to be like, right, that's it. You're going to be selling your body. You're going to, they build up that relationship. <laughs> You're like, right, that's it. You're going to be selling your body. <laughs> right. You, you, no, but it's, it, it doesn't work that way. Like to, you meet no. him today and tomorrow he's got you out there doing that. They groom you. They draw, yeah, they, draw you yeah. in. 
So they have to they have to like build a foundation for their case. They're building a case that whole time to present it to the judge, which is you, because mm -hmm. they're figuring they can trick the judge, and they're building their evidence. The the evidence is this: I care about you. Well, look what I did for you. I love you. Well, don't you know that your family's not there for you? I mean, look at your family. They're mm -hmm. jacked up, but look at me. I'm there for you. Anyone this is the things he would say. And I'd be like, yeah. And I would be like, he's and right. <laughs> and I you probably by this point shared with him how the relationship with your, how your father treated your mother, right? How your father was towards you and your brothers. So by this time, he already knew he already knew what you were looking for. He already knew the buttons, yes. to be able to, the triggers to be able to, and the things to be able to say to you that, well, I'm not doing this, your family, but look at your family. I'm here for you. I love you. I'm not treating you that way. I'm providing for you. So he's drawn you in and, and you, you've developed feelings for this person. And then what happened? Right. You trust right. him implicitly. I did. They're not going to hurt you. They're, like you said, he's your boyfriend. He's your Richard Gere and Pretty Woman character. He's the, all of that to you. And then when they've got you, that's when. And, and this is the other thing. Like, he would say, well, if your family found out what you were doing, and he would like, you know, that's the thing is that I would get threatened with that. For, mm -hmm. Actually, from all the traffickers, like, I could call your parents up right now and tell them that you're doing A, B, and C. And it's just like, oh. Oh, I was mortified. I didn't want them to know mm -hmm. that secret. See, secrets make you sick, but secrets also are a way to control and to manipulate. Yeah. You know, yeah. they have your secret pictures. You have the secret things you've done. You've broken the law. And, they're, and you're just like terrified that if that person finds out. So you do whatever they say. Yep. I that, mean, it's kind of what's going on right now when people are, it's called blackmailing. Yeah. Basically. Blackmailing, it's black hatting. Okay. So it's not cool. And uh, it's, it's again, like the mafia, they have something on you. And once they have that info on you, you just got to be a puppet for them and you, and you play along. And you know, the thing is with me, I got smarter and more wisdom and more experience. I started stashing money, you know, each person that I was with, I got smarter and better and finally, finally broke free all the way, completely broke free all the way in 2003. Like, but you know, in between I had a little bit of freedom in there. Uh, but, um, the, the, the day that I really just was like, I am done with all the drugs, turning tricks, everything. I ran a corporation for my friend that took me out of the trafficking for many years, but the trafficking was still in me, the pain and all the hurt and the trauma. Ooh, and I didn't think highly of myself, but on August 2nd, 2003, girl, that was it for me. I surrendered 100% to the Holy Spirit, God, and asked him to intervene and to save my life. And I didn't want to die, Allison J. I did not want to die that day. And I knew that if I didn't stop what I was doing, I would die. And, and so, so ask you what what exactly that point in 2003 that went because did anything happen what is was anything going on for you that yeah I mean that, the thing was is I, I had a lot of trauma that was surfacing and resurfacing so the year be the about a year before I overdosed I was doing drugs and I had not been doing drugs prior to that for many 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 years I started doing painkillers and cocaine and, and then I started, my friend was out of town mm -hmm. and I would leave my house and go down on the strip and I would turn tricks to get more drugs oh. um, and to buy myself the things that I wanted. So I was kind of like trafficking myself in a way. He did not know I was doing it. And the night that it happened, uh, actually we were getting high together. <laughs> I was at the body shop and I did a bunch of cocaine. I was trying to actually prep a Cadillac Escalade, baby blue with sparkles. It was a pimp's car, believe it or not. One of our clients, we had several clients that were pimps in our automotive shop and I did too much cocaine and I literally had it. This awful, awful like pain in my chest and I fell to the ground and I went blind actually for a little while and uh, the ambulance was called and I was going to the hospital 
holding on to the EMT's hand and I was praying to Jesus saying, Jesus, please help me. Please help me. I, I don't want to die. And I literally, that day was such, such a life-giving day for me. It was the end of Fall Fallen, my old name. And I was back to being Annie again. Like I was a, just the original girl, the original woman that God had designed me to be. And I literally, I did a 180 degree turn. I stopped doing drugs. I stopped turning tricks. I basically got my life in order. I started reading the Bible. It was, it was incredible, an incredible time in my life. And I'll never forget reading God's word with my eyes wide open mm -hmm. and everything. Like I was in John today, actually, you know, John is one of the most phenomenal gospels, right? So when the word was, the word was God. And the, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like, okay, Jesus was the word. It's like, what? what say that again <laughs> like mm -hmm. what you mean jesus was flesh and he was the word i mean he was the word come true and in him was life and life to get, to live everlasting i mean all of these beautiful beautiful scriptures are just like i couldn't believe it i was like it was in front of me this whole time he's been the answer and i didn't flipping see it i didn't see it and now i see it and jesus i love you jesus I love you so much for what you've done for my life. Like I, I'm getting emotional now thinking about it. He became my rock. He became my best friend, my boyfriend, my husband, all that. And I'm not talking about sexually. Okay. So don't get me wrong. Anyone listening going, Oh, she's weird. No, he has to become that for you. He, you have to become his bride. If you want into the kingdom, you have to become his bride. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. You cannot play this. You can't date him. You can't flirt with him. It is on. Like your commitment has to be solid. Okay. Mm -hmm. You follow him. It's a all or nothing for me. That's how I live my life. He said, he said, those who will try to save their lives will lose it. And Lord, I'd rather be with you. I don't want to try to save my life anymore. I tried that for how many years, Allison J? How mm -hmm. many years? Trying to save my own life? Look, Jesus, this is your life. I give my life to you. You do what you will. And so that's what I decided to do that day. Mm -hmm. um, I'm telling you, transformation. And Allison, it's still happening to me. I am still being transformed by his word. I am still being transformed by his voice, by his presence. He's just the most beautiful thing ever. If no one's ever known Jesus, I want to invite anyone on this that are listening, watching. You got to give him a chance. You got to give him a try. I'm going to tell you what. You won't lose if you do. You can't lose anything. He is life. He is light. He is joy. He is peace. He is faithfulness. He is um, benevolence. He is omnipresent. He's your best friend. He's your support. He's your cheerleader. He loves you. He loves you. And I want to speak to that soul right now that feels like, well, if they knew what I did, he would never love me. That's a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus loves you just the way you are. Amen. He meets you where you are on the ground, in the bottom of the well, addicted, uh, even pedophiles, he will love them, okay? He doesn't love what we do. He loves us because he created us for his purpose. Nice. And if you can just, and pimps, he loves pimps. He loves drug dealers. He loves arms dealers. He loves crooked politicians, right? Mm -hmm. He loves, the, he loves the, the evil of the evil in the world. And the thing is, is that when we acknowledge that he loves us, and we can, we can receive him into our hearts. And the, the, the realization of what we've done against him will hit you like a ton of bricks. And I remember that day that I was, I was writing down all the things I had done against God during my time being in the sex industry and being trafficked. And I know some of it wasn't all my fault, but some of it was my choice, like in the very beginning to get into it. Um, but when I could write down all the things that I knew that I wanted to take back, and I remember the Holy Spirit stopping me saying, stop, 
because was I was a couple hours into my list, right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to write this down. <laughs> and I, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, stop right now. And he just asked me, it's gone. The minute you said, the minute you said my name, when you said, Jesus, I surrender all, it was, it was finished. I finished it on the cross, actually, before you even asked me, but now you acknowledge that. Your sin is gone. It is gone. I'm not going to bring it up to you again. If someone brings it up to you, that's the accuser of the brethren. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. There's, what's that scripture? There is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation. Mm-hmm. Romans 8, 1. So, yeah. Come on, somebody, girl. I, I don't know. I felt the Holy Spirit just show up just now a little bit ago. Well, not that he wasn't here in the beginning, but I just feel this presence of God right now. That I'm just, I feel like God wants to really the people that are listening he's been knocking at your door he's been he's been tapping you on the shoulder and telling you that you shouldn't have done that like little soft gentle words and he's trying to talk to you you know and all you got to do is just close your eyes and just ask him into your heart and say jesus forgive me for my sins come into my life change my life Show me the way, light my path. I'm going to follow you in Jesus' name, amen. That's it. And if you do that and you really mean it, you're coming into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the kingdom of God on earth, because the kingdom is within us, the mm -hmm. kingdom of heaven, which is where we're going to go when our bodies are no longer our tents. Right? We're going to have heavenly bodies. They're going to be beautiful and young and no disease. We eat all we want. We can fly around. <laughs> right, that part. Hey. That part. That, I'm, I'm, I'm there for that part. The eat what you want. <laughs> so, but thank you. I, I really appreciate you doing that. And I really appreciate the fact that you are so open about your journey. And not just your journey, because... This isn't supposed to be like a salacious um, conversation, but also so open about your love for the Lord and wanting to win souls for the kingdom. So thank you so much for being willing and your obedience in. Al Alice and Jay, if no one knows this right now, we're, we're in the last days, girl. Mm -hmm. The time is upon us. Yes, absolutely. I'm not wasting any time. Okay. I'm inviting as many people as I can. And so what do I do? I hookers for Jesus, right? Like we have a home for women. Now I, I we started this organization. I should say I and the Holy spirit in 2004, 2005 with a simple outreach. It was like, I, I gave out my business card on the strip and I was like, Hey, give me a call if you need help. I was like, hi, you know, but in my heart, I was so burdened. I was so burdened for the women that I knew and the young girls that I knew that I had left behind. And I was like, you know what, God, I think I heard what you said. He said to me, go down on the Las Vegas strip and tell those women that I love them. It was so simple. So that's what I started doing. Know where to put them. They would be like, I'm going to leave my trafficker now. I'm going to leave my pimp. And so I started bringing them to my house, which is not good. Like I had roommates at the time. They kind of got mad at me. Like, are you bringing home strays, Annie? I'm like, not really. These are worthy women. Like, <laughs> but that's when Destiny House was born, and uh, we're we're on our our second property, and we just added three beds. We have thirteen beds right now, and we're starting. Um, we have another. I think there's going to be six beds in the new house, so we have a transitional house that we're going to be moving into for this second other property. So that's going to be for ladies that graduate our first year program and they get this going to be the work program and college program. So it's kind of exciting. That's another six beds. So I'm telling you, God's doing something and we're in Las Vegas. This is Sin City, they call it, but I call it the city of lights, the city of grace. Uh, we have the highest trafficking per capita in the country, according to the Crichton study. They before Craigslist shut down, they had they did this study where they they gathered New York, Los Angeles, uh, I believe Chicago was in there, a couple other cities, Las Vegas was in there, and what they did was they counted how many ads were put out, put out per person, and how many 
uh, people were being sold on Craigslist, Nevada had the highest rate per capita, highest rate. Uh, and that was like something I had already known, Allison J. I knew that we had the highest rate of trafficking. Um, so, you know, this is the place where the devil almost took me out, but this is the place where God gave me his grace, girl. This is where he laid it on me and he laid it on me thick and the glory and the anointing, just like the love of Christ hit my body. And I was like, I gotta do something. I gotta help these girls. I gotta help these women, you know, and we help um, uh, gay, gay men and LGBTQ and women, of course, as well. And so uh, whoever's being trafficked, we're open for that. You know, Destiny House is a place for women right now, uh, but we still, with our outreach, we help every, every type of person that's being abused or trafficked. So, okay. yeah. And I know that you- <laughs> And I'm married now too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get onto that. But it just goes to show a story of redemption, that how your life has changed to the point of, because a lot of, and that's part of what a lot of people need to overcome as well. They're probably looking at it thinking, who's going to want me now? With everything I've done, everything I've gone through, I'll never have the, the husband and the children and so on. But your journey can show them, actually, mm. you can have it. You, you still yes. have it. The only thing that could be stopping you from having it is the mindset you have that you can't. You know, there was a dream put in my heart it's kind of like MLK he said he had a dream you know that one day everybody would become equal and free right so for me my dream was one day I'm gonna find a man who really loves me for who I am and, and they're gonna love me without my makeup on they're gonna love me when I'm old they're gonna always care about me and of course that that savior was Jesus but Jesus wanted something else for me um, I met my future husband on MySpace through my friend Heather Veach, through Kevin Max from DC Talk. Kevin and my husband are friends, so he's in a band called Striper. And in fact, I was in Italy, or not Italy, that place too with Striper, uh, in England uh, when Striper played in the UK. It was so fun at this UK club. I don't know where. It's kind of close to the Big Ben clock. I can't remember the name of the club, but... Um, I literally like met him on MySpace and we started dating probably a couple months later. And then we got married in 2009. I met him in 2008, got married in 2009. And it was like a dream wedding. Like he sang to me down the aisle, a song called baby. If you ever heard it, you would ball your eyes out. Like I need to, he actually re-recorded it. And I want, I told him, I want you to release the song because it is so beautiful. It's like, <laughs> in fact when when it starts it goes baby you're so beautiful you don't even know that's just how you are at your minimal you're bigger than any yeah it's just like whoa the words are just yeah that's he's saying that to me okay. now, here's what's killer mm. here's what's really just seriously beautiful I was walking down the aisle. I had my princess dress on. I had a crown on. It was all white. There were, there were Austin crystals all over my dress, you know, on the, on the, the bottom part, it was poofy, you know, like real poofy on the bottom, like a princess. And my daddy, my, my real father walked me down the aisle and he was crying tears down his face when he gave me away. It was so redemptive, like, I can't explain to you. And at that point, my dad had found out about the trafficking, the prostitution, and he cried in 2006. And he asked me for his forgiveness for treating him, my mother bad and my brothers and me. And I told him I forgave him. My daddy died in 2016, but uh, a lot of peace. We had a relationship completely restored. My dad is actually a beautiful person inside. He was abused as a child. So, so, you know, the chain of fools I told my dad on that day in 2006, when I saw him on Christmas Eve and he apologized to me, I said, daddy, the chain of fools is broken. Mm. Now that you know, he goes, I feel like 
the reason why you went into what you did for a living is because it's my fault. And I just cried with my daddy. I hugged him and I said, daddy, I forgive you. You know, it's, wow, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> so, Peace. you know, my husband is a good, it's just a beautiful spirit. My husband, he plays guitar, he sings, he records with Striper. He's been in Striper for 30 some years. They're a band that uh, crossed over on MTV. They sing about Jesus, girl, on MTV. What? Like not in a blasphemous way. Mm -hmm. They were literally lifting him up and singing rock metal about Jesus before anybody was. And my husband was part of that, which is really cool. Um, and so now my husband is still in Striper. He is in a little bit of a health crisis. He has two brain tumors and one operation's happening very, very soon. We need prayers for that. Absolutely. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a major tri trial actually, but you know what? God is good still. He is good. Mm -hmm. And you know what helps me when I have anxiety and I want to speak to anyone out there right now. You feel like, especially with, you know, COVID, the financial crisis, the political climate in some people are having health problems as well. You guys got it. You just got to like open up a Bible, start reading the gospels, turn on some real soft music, worship music specifically and start reading. And I'm going to tell you something, your anxiety attack, it will dissipate. It'll just like turn into nothing. And I'm a high anxiety person. Trust and believe that I, you know, <laughs> man, you know, when I, when we had coronavirus, my husband and I, and he was in the hospital for pneumonia, girl, I could not sleep. I was just, and I, I remember the Holy Spirit saying to me, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm worrying. He's like, <laughs> he put his hands out like, give that to me. <laughs> what are you doing, Annie? Like, stop worrying about your husband. I got him in the palm of my hand. Mm. Do you not trust me? That's the thing, Allison J. Do we trust God with the outcome of our trial? Are we willing to hand it over to him? A lot of us aren't because we don't think he's going to give us the outcome that we need. Not even right? Need. It's, I don't even think that we need. He, I think a lot of us aren't because we're not, we don't think he's going to give us the outcome that we want. Yes. Many of us, yes, exactly. Many of us, what we want is not necessarily what it is we need. And well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, my wants and my needs are the same thing. <laughs> Sometimes like, <let's, laughs> you know, like, Lord, my desire is that you would have my husband get through these surgeries, mm -hmm. get better and live another 20, 30 years with me. That's my desire. <laughs> is it your will? Is it your will? And can I accept that? If mm. it's not, my will is not your will, right? And that so. is, that, but that's the thing though, because I remember a few years ago, um, I spoke to someone and um, they were just on my mind and I says, I need to call to find out how they're doing. And it was just in my spirit. Like I'm thinking, I wonder if everything's okay with his marriage. So I called up, I hadn't, we hadn't spoken in a couple of years and fortunately his number was still the same. So we called up and I asked him and he says, oh no, we're going through a divorce. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what happened? And his words to me were, he says, Alison, many times we want what we want and we then we just want God to rubber stamp it. And that was the same. Yeah, that's what he said to me. And I've never, I mean, this was probably about, it was before I moved here to the US. So we're talking about 10 or so years ago, he said that to me. And I never forgot that, like, yeah, that's true. Because a lot of the times what we want is, for example, many of us want to get married. And I believe if we desire to get married, that's God's will for us. However, for some of us, it's who we want to get married to. <laughs> so, but, but Absolutely. This one, I want this one, I want this one. And God's like, no, 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 I got that one for you. That one, no. He's not yours. And, and that many times that's what it is. What we want and how we're looking for it is not necessarily how it's going to come. So that's why a lot of us don't take our hands off stuff. 
because we're still trying to because have you ever been like like on a horse or something and you're trying to steer it one way and it's pulling you the other like no I'm going and and many of us that's what we're like we're holding on to the reins of this thing for dear life and goes like yeah but no I, I'm I'm telling you it reminds me of that little cartoon that we see with the little girl with the teddy bear and God has a bigger one in back of them and she does not want to give that teddy bear up she's like no and, and, and that's it- a lot like us like he has something better and if we could just trust him and it's that trust bridge. It's that bridge that we see that looks like there's a big chasm between us and that, that outcome. And we're afraid to cross it because we don't know if it's going to hold or not. We're like, but what if the bridge falls apart? But what if what I want doesn't manifest? But what if on the other side of that is something I didn't see? And the person I love so much is on the side of the part that I want to come true but they don't get to be with me on the other side. I mean, most people are not going to want that, Allison. They want to be with that person. They want to be with that situation because they can't fathom letting go of that because it's their stability or, or their object of stability where they worship that stability and they, they're only worshiping that. They're not worshiping our creator. And they, they forget that he created that whole situation anyway on, on a lot of the times, right, for us to learn. So this is a very hard time for me, but I, you know, I'm going to push through it. Uh, I, I want what God wants. Mm-hmm. And we will and be God for your husband and your strength also. As you're thank you. During this, because absolutely you're going to be doing that. I really appreciate it because it's hard. I'm not going to lie. And, and let me tell you something about the fans. The fans of Striper, they're so faithful and they're so like, great followers they'll go to any concert they'll just show up and fill up a whole club and they are so worried about my husband it's so sweet um so that gives me a lot of a lot of like strength to know that people care about him and it's not just me Mm -hmm. and so I know there's a lot of people praying which is good right but let's all just pray Let's pray for healing, of course. That's God's ultimate. Of course, you know, disease is not of him, but that we are going to settle for what God gives us. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to contend, girl. I'm going to contend. Okay. I'm going to believe him. And I'm going to just say, Lord, you know, continue to heal my husband. So. Absolutely. And we, we stand in agreement with you on that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So before I let you go, one of the things I wanted to ask you is I want you to share the programs that you have to offer because I see that you've got um, impacts through you offer transitional support to at-risk women who want to escape the commercial sex industry and mm-hmm. touch a little bit on what that is what you pr- and what you provide. So if someone comes to us that they want to get out of you know, it harms way of their trafficker, we will provide them resources, like especially in Las Vegas to do that. We'll go get them. We'll take them to the hospital if they need a ride, to their doctor appointment, to their court. We'll help them uh, achieve housing. And, and what we mean by that is if they want to apply for Destiny House, they could come here and apply for Destiny House. And if they're a good fit, they can move in and stay here with us for a year. Or if we're not a good fit for them, we'll find them somewhere else to go. Well, we have resources in the community itself that we partner with, you know, uh, different um, safe house shelters for uh, domestic violence and also other homes that we work with in the Valley and shelters we work with in the Valley. And then across the country, there's places in different states that we work with that we refer clients to, uh, women that are in need, that need help. And we'll, if we need to help them fly there, we'll get them a plane ticket, uh, make sure they make it to the airport. Uh, basically, we're we're walk along advocate for you know usually every step of the way until they get into their shelter, and then we let the other shelter take over with their caseload. And usually, what happens is because we've established such a great relationship with each client, is that they'll usually call us back and tell us, "Oh, it didn't work out here. You know, I still want to come to Destiny House. If they if they didn't want to at first, they'll always say, "Well, can I come there now?" And so we stay with them along the entire journey process of getting out of the sex industry and into the freedom that they need. And, and, and that could even look like not just shelter, but, 
you know, finding uh, some education for them, finding a career path for them. We partner with people in our community uh, that help them get jobs, that do vocational training. And so, and that's also part of Destiny House program. Once the ladies get in here, they, they do an extreme like self actualization, like where they look at themselves and they figure out, you know, why their trauma is so heavy and we bring them into trauma classes and they have their private trauma counseling once, twice, three times a week, sometimes more. It just depends on each client that we have. And then we have group counseling and then we have equine therapy. Uh, we have gardening, we have cooking, uh, they have a workout trainer that comes and then we have also financial training for before they go out and start managing their own finances. Um, I mean, general fellowship, of course, that we offer the ladies to go to church. They don't have to, if they don't want to, but we are faith based. So uh, we're very gentle. We let them have choices. We don't force them. And, um, you know, honestly, our program is very unique because it is survivor designed is designed by me and other survivors and it's also very trauma-informed and I like to say this trauma-informed care looks like Jesus <laughs> he doesn't force us he's a gentleman he's gentle he's loving you know I tell the house managers when you walk into the home if you don't have your full tree with the full fruits on it for the girls to pick off each fruit and take a bite out of that fruit that you have you can't do this you need to have love, joy, peace, faithfulness, kindness, goodness, you know, patience, right? Joy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so, yeah. And so the other thing is we have a jail program as well. Uh, the COVID shut this part down, but the, our, our advocates just went to jail the other day to talk to a couple new clients that are potential clients for Destiny House. Um, we go in there once a week and we do a class called Ladies of Destiny. I love it so much, Allison J. I get to teach we teach about everything under the sun from wisdom to domestic violence, to trafficking, to faith, to how to get out of the sex industry, how to, how to get away from your abuser, uh, just basic life skills, everything to help raise up someone to be independent and to be able to handle their lives and not become a reentry prisoner or jail person, right? We want to stop that cycle of of the repetitive going back and forth, getting arrested for, you know, laundering or, or theft or, or uh, grand larceny, prostitution. And yeah, because usually behind that is some abuse as a child. So yeah. we try to do, we teach about trauma and yes, there is, there, there is the faith-based track with that. So the ladies get my book. In fact, I have to bring another box of books there of my book. And um, so, yeah. And then we do our outreach, which that kind of got, messed up because of COVID and we go out onto the strip and we pass out bags with gift, ba you know, gifts inside of them with, uh, you know, help for them, resources. I mean, anywhere from chocolates to makeup, to candles, to lotions, uh, perfumes. I mean, things that women like, right. Things that I would like. So that's really what started Hookers for Jesus. It really, that's what started everything was that simple outreach just walking in the casino, sitting at the bar, talking to the ladies that are working. That, and I mean, literally being trafficked, right? When I say working, I don't really mean working. Like we used to call them back in the day, working girls. But, you know, these women are being trafficked at the bars, inside the casinos, up and down the elevators. They're working for escort services. They're doing their own ads. Their traffickers are putting the ads out and they're on the strip. I mean, I just can't believe men are still purchasing women. Like I'm still mad about it because trafficking is not apparently reached everybody yet. Like where are these people's heads at? Like this is a normal part of their life. Go on a business trip, buy someone over the internet. I mean, cheat on your wife. Like, come on, dude. Yeah. So do, girl, don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> and I've heard you mention destiny's house. So if, if um, someone's listening and they're like, that's it, I, I want to get out of this, but I don't have the money to go to Destiny's house. Um, it's not, we're not going to charge her money. We're, uh, it's free because we're a nonprofit. So transportation here, the journey here will not cost a dime. We will figure out a way to get your sweet soul here that needs help. We'll figure out a way and we'll make a way. 
So, and as far as COVID, we never shut down. So that's why I opened up the apartment on, on our property. We have a little apartment. It's super cute. It's, it's a uh, two story. It used to be the garage. Not anymore. <laughs> it's three apartments now. Um, and it's two stories, like I said, and that is our COVID apartments. So any new client that moves in gets to be there for two weeks to quarantine. And she has her own little kitchen, her own little TV and all the things she needs, clothing and bedding and, you know, shelter. We bring her food and everything. And until her COVID test is negative, then she can move into the general population of the main destiny house, which is right next door. I mean, it's right on the same property. So um, it's really cool. I, I'm so excited about it. Like we've already, we already have a client in there right now as we speak. Okay, great. Um, and it's awesome because you, you need that. When you have a shelter, mm -hmm. you can't just add a bunch of people that have COVID. I mean, yeah. this is a problem. You can test for COVID and be negative, And then the next day you're going to show symptoms and you're already in the population spreading it to everybody. So that's why that quarantine apartment is really special. And when COVID's over, hey, we'll probably still use the space for just extra space and extra clients. It'll be great. So we're excited about that. The new house is going to be called the dream house. Okay. Um, and we're still scouting that property right now as we speak. So, yeah. <laughs> about the dream house. So Annie, um, we have mentioned the um, Destiny's house. We've also mentioned um, some of the resources that you provide and the programs. So if somebody here in this needed to reach out and find you, and find Destiny's House, find Hookers for Jesus. How can they find you? Where can they find you? Yes, we're on the internet. It's just hookersforjesus.net. And make sure you put, don't put in .com. That's a bunk website. That's not us. It's hookersforjesus.net, like fishnet. And there's a contact information on there. You can email us or just call that number. I actually have the phone on me. This is my hotline. And this phone right here, I can say, hello, hookers for Jesus. Can I help you? And I'll get you to the right person if you need help. I mean, it might be me answering the phone. Who knows? <laughs> you know, and there's also a normal office number on there as well. If they want to talk to someone else that works here. I have right now, Allison J, uh, 20, I think 20 employees, maybe 21. Wow. I'm a CEO girl. <laughs> but this work is, is very, yeah, it's, I'm telling you, this work is um, not for the faint of heart. I've wanted to quit more times than I could count. I've been backstabbed more times than I could count. Uh, the Judas kiss is the ultimate test of leadership, by the way, the ultimate test of wisdom and leadership and discernment. And so it's, it's been a journey. Like you said, it's not a story. It's a journey. I'm still on it. I'm not quitting anytime soon. Uh, again, it's... <laughs> This is hard work. You know, you can get re-triggered doing this, but you have to stay strong. Mm -hmm. And I would want to say this to all the practitioners out there and the psychologists and all the ministers, make sure you're taking care of you. If I can give any advice, do not burn out. Yeah. If you do notice the signs, make sure you're taking care of yourself. If you're getting angry, you don't want to go to work. You're getting irritable. You're losing sleep. Those are signs you're burnt out. Okay. You're sleeping too much. Can't get out of bed. Signs you're burnt out not passionate about the work you're doing anymore. You're tired. Mm -hmm. Signs you're getting burnt out. You're getting angry at your clients. Signs you're getting burnt out. You really need to take a step back, even if it's sabbatical for two months, two weeks, two years, whatever it is, get healed, get the therapy you need, and then come back swinging. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Because that's the, that's the key though, isn't it? So many times yes. people are just so pushing forward, pushing forward. I have to do this, have to do this. They need me. They're relying on me. They're dependent on me. And one thing I always say to people is if you don't take care of yourself, then you're actually not going to be any good to anyone else. And as we see, absolutely. If, if those yes. of us that have flown several times, even if you've flown once, what do they say? Put your own mask on first before you assist anyone. Absolutely. Absolutely, girl. Yes. You got it. So yeah, that's how you get a hold of us. You can also call us at 702-883-5155. All right. Thanks. So you. yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Annie, I thank you for your time. Thank you for your honesty and your transparency. It has been 
educational, it's been thought provoking, mm -hmm. it's just, just everything you can think of, it's been that. And I just yeah, you're the sharing. You're welcome. You know, the one last thing. I have this right here, my book, Fallen Out of the Sex Industry and Into the Arms of the Savior. If anybody wants to know the full story and how it happened, how I got groomed and everything and trafficking stats are in here and how to get how you get trafficked and what the trafficking signs are, you got to get this book. It's on Amazon. It's on our website. Just click on it. Get it. Give us a comment. I would love a little review because most people tell me they can't put it down. It reads like a movie. So, yeah, <laughs> a very exciting movie. <laughs> it's Thank not you. boring. Trust me. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. We'll You're make welcome. Information is on the website as well for anybody wanting to reach out to you, wanting to purchase your book. Okay. Great. Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Yeah, you too. Fantastic. All righty. Have a good evening. Yeah, Allison. You too. Girls, stay safe. I'm be prayed up for tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Prayed up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we'll be remembering you and your husband as he goes into Thank you. As well. Thank you so much, Allison. Alrighty, Talk bye. to you later. Take care. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye bye. If you know or you suspect someone is being trafficked, a victim of trafficking, if you yourself are a victim of trafficking, please reach out to Annie. As she had mentioned, the website is hookersforjesus.net. They will get you help. And as she mentioned, wherever you are, they will make arrangements. They will find a way to get you out of the situation you are in and into somewhere safe. Thank you so much for listening to Conversations with Alison J, The Journey to Hear.